Is God opposed to you being happy? But is that the goal? Okay. Anybody else? Hmm? To bring glory to him. Holiness. I'm sorry? To make disciples. To make disciples. Okay, let's see what the article says. To make us holy and blameless. Someone said that. What is holy? To be set apart. Is that all holiness is? Set apart from. Okay, keep going. Keep going. <laughs> so it's to be set apart from something to something. That's, a, that's an important definition. To be set apart. Okay, I'm set apart from what? From people? Sin. Aren't I supposed to be set apart from some people? <laughs> yes. <laughs> be set apart from some people. Because Paul's going to tell them in chapter 6, 5 and 6, there's some people they need to be setting themselves apart from. But he's talking about people in the church who are living like. He said, you can't be set apart from sinners. You would have to go out of the world. I'm talking about a so-called brother or sister who is living like the world. You need to be set apart from them. Because we, we, to me, he wants to make us holy and black. What's blameless mean? Some translation would say above reproach. How can you be blameless and you still be sin? Keep short accounts. What do you mean by keep short accounts? If and when you do sin, you turn immediately, you repent and turn immediately into the government of the church and turn around. Okay. So we deal with sin quickly, 1 John 1 9. It also means you strive to live a lifestyle that if an accusation is brought against you, it can't be found to be true. Because people are blaming Paul of all kinds of things. That's why he has to write the second Corinthians to defend his ministry. Because he's getting blamed for all kinds of things. But none of the charges can stick. So it's not that people won't blame you for stuff. It just shouldn't be able to what? Stick. That's part of what it means to be blameless. It's not about being perfect. Okay. Ephesians 1 4 deals with that. Philippians 1 6. Philippians 2 13. Ephesians 3 14 and 21. This is God's goal for those who make up the church. For Christians, for born again believers, for those he has elected, that he regenerated, and that he justified. Do we really strive to live holy and blameless? A disciple does. A follower of Christ does. One who is owned by God does. If you're keeping the short accounts, you're striving to do that. But if you're not keeping the short accounts, you're not striving. But if I'm always making excuses for my sin, I'm only human, anybody perfect, I don't feel like it. I have up and down days. How are you really striving for? You know, I listen to a lot of sermons. I listen to a lot of preaching because I enjoy listening to preaching um, and sermons. Um, even some of my favorite preachers, pastors, will say stuff and then cancel out what they said. By saying no one does this perfectly, we all don't do it perfectly. Then why do you say it? If God really doesn't expect that, then why do we say it? Why exhort people to do something that you just told them they couldn't do? 
or that nobody does. We're supposed to love the Lord of God with all our heart and all our mind and our soul and our strength. And we all fail at that. And we do. But why say that and then come around and say, ain't nobody doing it? Does that not make sense to anybody else but me? You just told me I'm never going to meet that. And if you tell my flesh I'm never going to meet that, guess what my flesh is going to say? Don't even try. It's all right if you don't. Why don't we just leave the exhortation out there and let it hang? And let the Spirit do what it's going to do based on the exhortation. I, you know, this is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians, it says in the same Corinthians, you all by your attitude behavior will determine how I come at you. You all by your attitude and behavior will determine how I come at you. Because I can come lovingly or I can come sternly. But it's your attitude behavior that will determine how I come. Because I have to speak authoritative. And authoritative speaking is not popular in our culture. Because nobody has a grip or a handle on absolute truth. So nobody can speak authoritatively. So people saying nobody can speak authoritatively. That's our culture we live in. So authoritative preaching is not real popular. But there really is no other kind than biblical. Provide us the Holy Spirit so that we experience an inner power to defeat the flesh. We looked at this before, Romans 8, 12, 17. Provide us the Holy Spirit so that we experience an inner power to defeat the flesh. You have, and he's going to say this to the Corinthians on Sunday, well, next Sunday, in two Sundays ahead that you have been provided everything you need to overcome. The grace of God, which encompasses a much larger scale than what we tend to look at, has provided and is providing everything you need to overcome and defeat the flesh. But we don't believe that. Most of the people that you know don't believe that. If I have everything I need to overcome the flesh, why are so many people still giving in to the flesh? And when God evaluates us, God doesn't evaluate you on your performance. He evaluates you based on what he knows you provide. With that thinking, doesn't line up with sanctification. How much do we even preach and talk about sanctification in church? When's the last time you ever heard a series on holiness? By any of the big wave preachers, the celebrities. We don't talk about holiness anymore. Because they don't believe it. No, we don't talk about, so we don't talk about sin, we don't talk about holiness. So that's taboo off limits. It, it doesn't scratch the itchy ears or the hurting hearts it's supposed to. or the fainting heart or the people who are struggling with mental illness and physical illness and you feel in the blank. That's what you need to be talking about, those things. Let's not talk about holiness. Of course. That's, I mean, we're defeating purpose with that kind of approach. Um, it, you know, it, it doesn't take it doesn't take the sinful nature long to um, entangle people in hopelessness uh, to a degree that uh, they're they're so confused uh, they they actually say things like uh, I don't have a choice. 
Hey, I got a 21, 20, 21, 22, maybe 23 year old guy who says that. 23 at the most. And he doesn't have a choice and he's, he's can, uh, Satan has done a job on him and with um, some false teaching that uh, says um, you have uh, you have some miraculous sand in you. It's crazy. Miraculous sand. Yes, and he spelled it out for me. Okay. S A N D. Okay. Okay. But I spelled S I N for him. <laughs> Well, yeah, well, there's, there's stuff out there. Let me read Romans chapter 8, verse 12 through 17 for you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. We were once debtors to the flesh before Christ. We are no longer debtors to the flesh now that we're in Christ. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but to receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs of Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Everybody wants a crown, but they don't want a cross. And there is no crown without bearing the cross. Okay. To purify us just as Christ is and was pure in the flesh. Now, you catch, catch how that's worded. To purify us just as Christ is. Now, how does that go with, I can't be like Jesus? Mm -hmm. Satan. I can't live like Christ lived. Or Christ did that because he was God. But the Bible teaches that one of the things that God wants to do, or one of his daily goals for his children, is to purify us as Christ did and was pure in the flesh. Not in his deity, in his flesh. While he was walking around on, human, on earth in his human flesh, that's what God wants for all his children. And what Paul is writing to the Corinthians and to every believer everywhere, as he says in the text, is that that is God's goal for us because that's what he's done on our behalf in electing you, regenerating you, and justifying you. Because he owns you. He's the originator of the church. He's the originator of your salvation. There is no glitch or glitches in what he has done. <coughs> when we say we, we, we can't, are we, are we eliminating um, God from the equation? When we say we've been redeemed by Christ as God. I, I, yeah, I think we're saying that, but I also think we're speaking out of a lack of understanding of what happened to us when we were born again, mm -hmm. from God's perspective. See, we make it all about, and that's why I went through the original road that I went through about how we normally invite people to come to Christ. If that's messed up and they got a messed up understanding of that, and we never deal with their sinfulness and what God has done for them in a what it means to be elected, what it means to be regenerated, what it means to be justified, then it's not surprising they come out with all kinds of skewed realities and understandings. What did the resurrection, what did the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ really do to sin? What did it really do? It removed the powers of uh, sin over the for who? Over the 
the person who believes in Christ. Or when we get to heaven? No. For, for, for now, sin will not be a problem when you get to heaven. So all the exhortations are for where? So if he wants us to be purified and pure, he ain't talking about when we get to heaven. You'll be as pure as you could ever be when you get to heaven. The exhortation is why you live in this dirty world. Why you have to make decisions between sin and righteousness. Because before the election, before the regeneration, before justification, we know what you was going to choose. Because there was no power in you for you to choose anything else. But since you have been elected, since you are regenerated, since you have been justified, since you have the Holy Spirit, since Jesus has risen from the dead, since he is the Lord, how now should you live? So it's no matter, it's no longer a matter of have to, it's a matter of what do you choose? And we made a choice the day we got saved, didn't we? Didn't we? And our choice was we didn't want to go to hell, we want to go to heaven. Right? Is that the choice? I thought the choice was, I acknowledge you for who you are, I trust you, and I give my total allegiance to you. You're not an add-on. You didn't add something to my life. Salvation is not about God adding something to your life. Salvation is about God totally regenerating your life from the inside out. And without that understanding, people flounder. Hebrews 7, 26. Well, somebody read for me Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26 and 28. Somebody else get Titus 1, 15. Somebody else get 1 John 3, 3. When you get there, just read it. Tell me which one you're reading now. Hebrews 7, 26, chapter 7, verse 26 to 28. For such a high priest was uh, fitting for us who he is holy, blame, uh, harmless, undefiled, separated from sins, and has become high, higher than the heaven, who, do, who does not need daily, daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, and then for the people. For this he did once for all, when he offered up himself. Verse 28, for the law appointed as high priest men who have weak weakness, but the word of the oath, which came after the law, appointed the son who has been perfected forever. So once Christ finishes his work as our high priest, he doesn't have to keep doing that work over and over again. And that's talking positionally. But remember, as I said, 1 Corinthians, Paul is starting out saying, this is your position, and because of what God has done in positioning you, this must be how you behave. Because it all, it all starts with your position. Positional sanctification, justification, election, should lead to progressive sanctification that is putting off the old and putting on the new. And we ought to see that day by day. Okay. Uh, Titus 1 15. 15. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. Okay. That's not us after salvation. That's us before salvation. We were unpure, defiled before salvation. You can't be unpure, defiled after salvation when the high priest has done his work. And you have to keep doing it over and over again. How about the next verse, 1 John 3, 3, 3. 
and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Mm -mm. Now, it'd been nice if you left that last part off, right? <laughs> purifies himself. Then I can say, well, it's whatever I think it is. But what does he say on the end of that? Just as he is pure. Mm. So what's the standard of purity? Anything less of that? Not pure. So anybody who has this hope, which is what Paul's establishing to the Corinthians, and thus to every church, everywhere the text says, is to be the same for every believer everywhere of every age. Do we really strive for the purity, reflecting the purity of Christ? And here's the thing. God says, I've done everything for you to be able to do that. In Christ. So what will be your excuse? What will be my excuse for not doing it? Here it is. I didn't want to. That's all, that's all that you can say. Because ability is not your problem anymore. You say it one more time. Ability is no longer your problem. If I pay your electric bill for the rest of your life so that the current never gets turned off and your lights don't come on because you didn't flip the switch, you didn't have ability problem. Right? Power was not your problem, right? Lack of power was not your problem. What's your problem? I know pastors say turn on the switch, but I don't want to turn on the switch. Ability is no longer your problem. Christ has paid the price and purchased you with the blood of Jesus Christ. Ability is no longer your problem. But you still got to choose to turn on the switch. You still got to choose to plug into the socket so the lamp will work or the iron will work. We don't want to plug in and we don't want to flip the switch. So we spend all our time talking about, I can't. To experience the fullness, to experience the fullness of Christ as we work together encouraging one another. We never experience the fullness of Christ if we aren't around each other to encourage one another. When you're weak, then somebody else can be strong. When you're strong, you can be strong for somebody else. You can bear one of the burdens. You can walk beside one another. This is what God does daily go, God's daily go for his children on. And for people who say they don't need to go to church, you might not belong. Because any true believer knows that he needs every other believer. Every believer understands how much they need the other believer. And we debate whether we should gather. We debate whether we should join a church. We debate whether we should serve. We debate this. We debate this. We debate this. It's because you don't know who you are. And that's because we don't know who the, what the architect of the church has designed the church to be and do. You have spiritual gifts. He's going to address this with the Corinthians. You have spiritual gifts. But you have disunity. Even though the gifts are popping off all over the place. You have immorality, even though the gifts are manifesting themselves. So the church doesn't reflect the unity and oneness that it's supposed to reflect. But he wants us to experience the fullness of Christ as we work together encouraging one another. How do people experience Christ more and more? Because we work together. Because you have a gift that I don't have. You, I, so I have gifts that you don't have. Somebody else has, and all the gifts go together to make the whole thing work. But we debate how often we're going to interact. We ain't got time. Like, I'm too busy. I got this. I got that. I got this. I got that. I don't want to come back on Sunday afternoon. I don't want to come back on Sunday evening. I don't want to come to Wednesday night. 
but I'm totally dependent on your gift. And when your gift is not here, I'm lacking. Pastor Clay don't have all the gifts, in spite of what people think. There are gifts each one of you have that God has given you for the edification of the body. But guess what the church of Corinth was doing? <coughs> Being selfish with their gifts. Making more of certain gifts and less of other gifts. And so this was not being accomplished. And, and the Satan has done a great job of getting people to believe that the church is not important. That a church attendance is not important. That Bible studies are not important. That fellowship times are not important. That go to the light. Because we're so busy with the world. I will, I'll hang out with you all in heaven because I have to. On earth, I got choices. That's the way you look at it. Life gets in the way, doesn't it? You gotta go home and wash your clothes. Well, why didn't you do that Saturday and Friday? Why you gotta do it on Sunday? I gotta go get my rest. Why didn't you do that on Saturday? It's amazing to me in, in all these years of pastoring how conveniently things come up that people use as excuses not to participate in church activity that they don't use when they're in the world. But I'm not so shocked by that because my Bible says the people who are not elected, people who are not regenerated, people who are not justified, and people who are not progressing in their sanctification, that's exactly what they do. Because what we're going to see and what we're seeing in 1 Corinthians, carnality dominates these people's lives. Fleshiness dominates these people's lives. But they're positionally Christian. Because Jesus is not Lord. It's the same thing that we went through in Colossians. Does he have first place in The Chiefs won a temporary piece of metal, and I'm happy about that. I don't worship at their altar, but I'm happy about that. People closed down businesses today. They closed down the YMCA's all across Kansas City. Offices were closed, schools were closed, so they could go worship. People who want a piece of metal. They climbed trees, they stood out in cold weather, they got there at four o'clock in the morning, service didn't start till one. But then when it comes to the things of God, who is supposed to have first priority, we can't even get to Sunday school on time. We don't even want to come to prayer meeting. Does anybody see something wrong with the church? What motivates a person to get up at 4 o'clock for a 1 o'clock service? And camp out. What motivates them to do that? Some man has a high priority. And we say Jesus is our highest priority and we can't get to Sunday school on time? We can't come to prayer meeting on Wednesday night? Anybody see something wrong with that? Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just twisted. But I'm sitting up here watching this parade and I'm saying, look at all these people. How did they get 500,000 plus people to react this way? Because 500,000 at this rally and parade, that's the only 
and get 80,000 in stadium. And people drove two hours to come to the service. Some four, some five, some flew on planes. Some people rented hotel rooms before they won the Super Bowl. Just to be close to Union Station. Who plans that far ahead? But then when we have many responsibilities, we can't plan ahead. Those people booked Crown Rooms at the Crown Center months ago in anticipation. Paul says in 1 Corinthians in chapter 1, verse that same anticipation ought to motivate us to do some things. Mm -hmm. But we're anticipating Christ. We're not anticipating the Chiefs on the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense to anybody? All right. To experience the excitement and power of walking in the Spirit. What is it to walk in the Spirit? What does that mean? What does that look like? Mm -hmm. How do you do it? Well, let me ask this question. Anybody in here walking in the spirit? <laughs> Accurately, precisely, and intentionally. Accurately, precisely, and intentionally. Okay. What does that mean? You take great care in fulfilling God's word. What does that look like? Walking in the spirit. Uh, when Put some shoe leather on this morning. Put some shoe leather on that thing. When you're walking in the spirit, you are being obedient. God's word. Uh, you talk according to the word. You act according to the word. Uh, you are being influenced and controlled by what you're being filled with. Anybody else? It goes back to what you were just saying. If, a, if we're walking in the spirit and Christ is our first priority, then we're Sunday school all the time. We're at Wednesday night Bible study and prayer service. We're at church functions when we come up. Anybody else? The simplest way to put it is, is that you're obedient to what God says. Okay. Anybody else? comes from like when you look at God's word and you know that you've just done that or you've fulfilled that and being obedient to that so that brings about that excitement and knowing that I mean you know from scripture that you're able to do it but to do it to pull it off to see it in action um, brings about excitement and to know that you've been pleasing in the Lord and what you've done so what does walking in the spirit look like in action what does obedience look like in action? All right, let's go to Ephesians. He, he gives us Galatians in the PowerPoint. We, we beat that to death. We picked that apart last time. Let's go to Ephesians. And really, uh, chapters 4 and 5 is what it looks like to be walking in the Spirit based on the book of Ephesians. Galatians 5 talks about the flesh versus the Spirit, so it talks about different attitudes and behaviors. Um, but this also talks about walking in unity. To be walking in the Spirit is to, and the power of walking in the Spirit is to walk in unity with your fellow brothers and sisters. is to reflect the characteristics of the new man versus the old man. Verses 17 to 24. It's not to grieve the spirit. Verses 25 and following. Chapter 5 says it's to walk in love. Verses 1 through 7. To walk in the light. Verses 8 through 14. To walk in wisdom, verses 15 to 21. 
So that's what it is to walk in the power of the Spirit. When you walk in the power of the Spirit, these things will be characteristic of you. When you're not walking in the Spirit, these things won't be. So that brain surgery is just Bible surgery. We don't know our Bible. To be walking in the Spirit is reflected in these things. These attitudes, these behaviors, these choices, these choices you don't make on a consistent, habitual basis. Then he talks about in marriage what it looks like. Raising your children what it looks like. Bond servants and master relationships. Put it on the whole armor of God. This is what it is to walk in the power of the Spirit, according to the Bible. Does that make sense to everybody? I don't have time to pick all that apart, take me forever, but I gave you the basic outline. Okay? Walk in love, walk in the light, walk in a new man, walk in unity, walk in your marital relationship, bond servants and slaves, and the whole armor of God. That's what it is to walk in the Spirit. That's what it will look like. So that's why you can look at your Bible and look at people and say, do they look like this? Because the Bible is defining what it is to walk in the power of the Spirit. Am I producing more of verse 22? Or am I producing more of verse 25 and 26? According to Galatians chapter 5. When 22 shows up, do I cancel it out with verses 25 and 26? Because in my, in my observation of scripture, what's listed in the deeds of the flesh, there's a direct correlation in the fruit of the spirit. Because there are contrasts and comparisons. So they have to have a direct correlation. So don't produce this, but produce this, because this is opposite of that. Have your regulations like that, this section? This is the opposite of that. So I can sit in a room and tell you exactly what's controlling for me. All I gotta do is look at the list. I ain't even got to make no doubt. Just look at the list. Why are they arguing? Why are they upset? Why are they talking to you each other? Somebody is in their flesh. Because if we were in the spirit, it would be unity. There would be love, and I wouldn't talk to you like that. I'm angry, so there's no joy, so I'm upset, there's no joy, so I gotta be in the flesh, I can't be in the spirit, because in spite of whatever someone's doing or not doing to me, I would have joy, because that's what the spirit produces. Does this make sense to anybody? It's never hard for me to figure out what's in control in the meeting. It's never hard for me to figure out what's in control of my own personal life. Because the list is very simple and very clear. Now I can deny it. I can lie to myself. I can reject it. But then the change is the truth. And we keep trying to change the truth. And what's showing up? Because we don't want to admit I'm on that list, I'm not on that list. Not hard. Whenever I sit with a couple and they're having issues, I can just look at the lips. Then I look at them. Flesh, spirit. Spirit, we won't be here long. Flesh, we might be here all night. It's not hard. God wants us to participate in his divine nature so that we will live and walk like him. How's that hit you? Live and walk like who? Why we keep going around so we can't be like Jesus? Why we keep going around? Nobody do that.
Well, you can't do it if you don't choose to do it. And you can't do it if you haven't been made to do it. But if you've been made to do it, and you're choosing to do it, the Bible says that's what God wants for his children. Let's go to 2 Peter 3.11. You, you know this. <clears throat> See, one of the things I've learned in my growth and my time is I've got to stop telling God what he did don't work when it comes to my salvation. And I learned that a long time ago. It doesn't work because you don't apply it. It doesn't work because you don't believe it. It doesn't work because you're not obeying. It doesn't work because you may not be what you think you are. And this is why he's going to tell the Corinthians in chapter 13, examine yourself to make sure you end the faith. Peter said, make your election sure. Just don't say it. Look at your life and see if it lines up with what election is supposed to produce. As God designed election and regeneration. You see how all this fits together? These are continual things throughout all the epistles. Because they're teaching the same thing that Jesus taught them to the church. Right? Somebody read for us 2 Peter 3 through 11. I think it's chapter 1, if I remember correctly. Yes, chapter 1, 2 Peter, read through 11. Somebody, anybody, anybody, somebody, somebody, going once, going twice. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. All right. In verses 3 to 4, we have what God did, right? In verses 5 to 9, this is what you do. In verses 10 and 11, here's the result. So this is what God intended, right? How many of you really believe you got the divine nature of God in you? Think about that for a minute. Don't raise your hand too fast. divine nature of God in you. How's that hit? Don't hit you. I'll wait. I got nowhere to go. Is it true? Whether I remember or not, is it true? So what do you think God's going to evaluate you on when you stand before him? See, here's the, here's the problem. Most of us think he's going to evaluate us only what we did and never refer to what he did to us. Because the base of his evaluation is going to be on what he know he did for us and to us. 
This is why he wants to say, well, why didn't you act? And that's what this text really lays out very well. As this divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So if I step before God and says, I gave you everything you needed to be everything I wanted you to be and I told you to be, what's your excuse? What are you going to say? Are you sure? If we say a lot of stuff now, you got all kinds of excuses and rationale now. Why wouldn't we have it then? Through the knowledge of Him, Christ, who called us by the glory and virtue by which you have given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. We talked about those earlier. Okay that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in heaven through lust. So we, we are to escape the lust is in the world now. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, so we, got, we need diligence, right? It's not automatic. It's not automatic. God has done this, but it's not automatic in living it out. You have to be diligent. Let me tell you something what I know about Patrick Mahomes and people like him, Tom Brady, people like him, those kind of guys. They had their fun today. He'll be going to work next week. That's diligence. Most guys won't start to work out for another two months. He'll be at work. Brady will be at work next week. Because they'll put this success in the past. And the goal now is to what? Run it back. That's one of the things that motivated me when I was an athlete, when I was young, when I was in college. I knew there was somebody out there working hard. And I didn't want them to outwork me. The only way I could be sure of that is that I was working more than they possibly could work. Diligence. It was planned diligence. I drove my family crazy when I was in high school. Crazy. Because I had a little ball hanging from the ceiling. I'd be down there hitting on that thing every day. I'd be throwing a ball against the wall, working. And you could hear it. But I had a goal in mind, diligence. Somebody was working hard, but nobody was going to work harder than me. And I've carried that into every aspect of my life. Diligence. Because you should want to be the best. You've been given abilities. You should not be squandering them. You've been given new life in Christ Jesus. You should not be squandering that. And so we have to add faith and virtue and knowledge and knowledge of self-control and self-control and on down the list. And I like verse 9. For he who lacks these things, I'm sorry, verse 8. For these things are yours and abound. Not just that they're yours, but they what? Abound. You will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. For he who lacks these things, on the flip side, is short-sighted even to blindness and had forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sin. You're not what you used to be. But you can forget it because you're not doing the diligence and the virtue and adding and abounding. And so many people in church today are just a part of a club. They're not a part of a life-giving body.
to have an attitude that is the same as Christ. My goodness. Sounds like a lot of Christ up in here. Do you have an attitude that is the same as Christ? Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which is also in who did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but humbled himself. Humility is tough in our American culture. It was not a virtue that was much admired in Roman or Greek culture either. Sometimes it's hard taking a back seat as a wife, as children, as a pastor, as an assistant pastor, as a deacon, as a trustee, as a worker. But humility is absolutely the attitude of Christ. Because if he had decided he wanted to be and, and, and reflect his equalness with the Father, who goes to the cross? Who takes on humanity? Who dies? Who allows the other one to raise him from the dead? Who fulfills the will of the Father in the plan of salvation? I think Charlie Kelsey gets it right. Know your role and know your place. But no one's more important than anybody else. It's just different. So that the whole plan gets done. The whole thing works. So there's unity and not disunity. God works in unity. Satan loves disunity. To grow to the fullness of Christ as a result of being actively involved in the local church. You need to be part of the local church. That's the originator of the church's plan. You need to be actively involved in your local church. And that means more than just Sunday morning. It really does. All right. You know those verses. Believers experience the work of the Godhead as a result of service provided through the use of their spiritual gifts. This leads to spiritual maturity. Listen, people in the church do not grow if people are not using their spiritual gifts as God has given them. They do not grow off my preaching alone or Bible study teaching alone. They grow because each person is taking their gifts as God has designed them in the body <coughs> and using them for the purpose that the gifts were given. So a lot of people in our churches are staying immature because people are not active in their service in the local church. Can't be when 80%, 20% of people do 80% of the work on the norm. First Corinthians 12, 4 through 8 talks about this. Ephesians 4, 12, 13 talks about this. We experience the work of the Godhead. You experience God actively working in the church when people are using their spiritual gifts to edify, to build up, to exhort, to comfort, to counsel, to disciple one another and evangelize the lost. There's no other way. I would love to tell you that Jesus goes to every church. <laughs> I read a quote. There was a black man, an older black man, who was going to this predominantly Caucasian church, and um, they wouldn't let him in. So he started to complain to God about the church. And Jesus responded to him saying, Well, don't feel bad. I've been trying to get into that church for 200 years. They don't let me in either. You see that in, in Revelation chapter 2. You see Jesus starting out walking in the, amongst the lampstand. By the time you get to the end of the book, he's on the outside. This happens because this doesn't happen. So 
They are a child to love one another, which leads them to experience the love of God. Are there some people hard, hard to love in the church? Absolutely. You know who one of them is? You. It's hard sometimes for God to love us the way we act. But he loves us anyway, don't he? Because it's by an act of his will, not how he feels. That's what God for your love is. There's nothing about them that would make you want to love them because it's just an act of the will. It's easy to love people you get along with. It's easy to love people you have things in common with. It's easy to love people that have some sense of merit about them where you feel you just got to love them. But then when there's nothing about them that's lovable and you love them, then you're loving like God loves them. Because that's how he loves us. May be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ who surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up with all the fullness of God. Don't you want to be filled up with the fullness of God? We'll stop there. Any questions? Any thoughts?